we were looking at uh, one dimensional Euler equations right in the last class and uh, the equation just to recall do q do t plus do e do x equals 0. I just want to make an observation from a this is a continuation of a comment I made earlier. Uh, so we will write it out in the delta form and so on right. I think uh, we will write the discretization out in the delta form the semi discrete version right. I uh, will make a few remarks and then we will look at applying boundary conditions that is where we were right. I was I think I ended by saying that I will show you how to apply boundary conditions in a proper fashion that is that is where am I right that is where I basically ended. Now uh, what we have seen so far as far as boundary conditions are concerned we have seen I will just draw a line we have seen that uh, this is the x axis t is of course the direction which we are marching we have seen at uh, x equals 0 we are prescribing total pressure and total temperature and we are doing this looking at it from the point of view of uh, gas dynamics that we know right. So I have a reservoir of some kind and from there I will typically know total pressure and total. these are classic problems that you see in gas dynamics and on the right hand side you have P ambient and if you recollect we said if you use a scheme like FTCS or BTCS you actually need you need Q at this point and you need Q at this point that is you need this, the total state at the boundary okay, which you are not going to have which the physics neither uh, the physics nor the mathematics they require the differential equations require. So it is our scheme that requires it we need to generate we have to somehow generate those boundary conditions and in the last class the point at which we had left uh, sort of left it is we were basically saying that if I look at this interface at that point and I look at the characteristics at that interface the direction in which see now I am only in space I am not I am not drawing time at all the direction in which these characteristics are propagating some information we know it is q1 hat q2 hat q3 hat but I use the word information because we said oh we are prescribing p0 t0 right they are not actually q1 hat q2 hat is that okay. So the q1 hat and q2 hat characteristics propagate inward information propagates inward they are in fact propagating q1 hat and q2 hat I am just using information as a general expression. So these correspond to the characteristics u and u plus a okay and to the same interface we have coming from the within the domain one characteristic which is propagating to the boundary u minus the u minus a characteristic okay this is for a subsonic inlet. In a similar fashion we saw right so I am just recapitulating what we have done earlier in a similar fashion we saw that here towards the interface on the right hand side at the exit we have u and u plus a okay so remember these are not characteristics I am not drawing them in the xt plane right I am only indicating the direction in which propagation is taking place. Okay, so that you do not fall into the trap of drawing these and saying they are characteristics fine they are not characteristics and propagating in the opposite direction is the u minus a right. So q3 hat is being propagated into the domain from the exit and q1 hat and q2 hat are apparently being propagated out of the domain okay. So at the interface I have I am going to see q1 hat you understand what I am saying I am going to see q3 hat coming one way and I am going to see Q, q1 hat and q2 hat coming the other way at the exit that is basically what if I am standing at the interface and looking at it that is what I am going to see in the characteristic coordinates is that fine okay. We just use these directions we use these directions to rationalize sort of a hand waving way of applying boundary conditions we use these directions to basically say why do not you extrapolate see we get away that is why I use the word some information is being propagated right I use that vague term because that then it allows me to say extrapolate some quantity right. So we extrapolate we used our physical intuition and basically said we will extrapolate u that is I propagate u from within the computational domain to the boundary so that I am able to get 
am able to determine all the conditions right at the boundary, I am able to determine Q. In a similar fashion at this point, he basically said well there are two quantities that should go from the interior to the boundary, they extrapolate what did I suggest T naught and U is it T naught and U, so T naught and U okay, so you can extrapolate T naught and U all from the same point T naught and U from within the domain okay and we justified it as I said in a hand waving fashion we justified it saying well there are two quantities that are going towards the boundary, let me, let me specify these and if I am able to determine Q it is fine okay and we will you can run this and see what basically happens you can use FTCS add that artificial dissipation that I was telling you about I will tell you ways to get around it but right now you can do that and everything is fine, is that fine. So there are two questions that crop up, clearly the boundary conditions that we are not we are generating are not in this case they are not Q1 hat and Q2 hat clearly. The second thing is we are extrapolating and we are using first order extrapolation, this was a question that some student asked me after the class last time right, we are extrapolating and if you think about it think back when I said approximating things in the beginning of the semester in the beginning of this course I said that if you have f of x and if you approximate f of x plus delta x as equal to f of x then that is a first order approximation, the term that you dropped off is delta x times f prime okay. So just to copy values when I say extrapolate just copy values from one point inward is a first order, so does it make is it a good thing after all we are using FTCS which is second order, is it a good thing to be doing this first order okay right. So we need to think about that a little because after all what differentiates one problem from another problem they are all Euler equations, they are all in a pipe in our case in this particular case the only thing that differentiates one problem from another problem right could be either the length of the pipe one possibility we have that degree of freedom or it is the boundary conditions. You notice even the length of the pipe basically shifts the boundary condition that is what it does. So primarily it boils down to right boundary conditions are at the edge of that length where and what okay. So if you do if you approximate your boundary conditions using a lower order approximation then it is likely that that will determine what is the order of your scheme is that fine. However remember the uh, sigma equals 1.1 demo that I did for wave equation, it started to diverge but then what happened all of it just went out of the domain. So in this case these are propagating to the right, so if you do a first order extrapolation here whatever error that you make is likely to just go out, it seems to be seems to be possible, seems to be possible okay, so downstream boundary conditions it may not matter, upstream boundary conditions it may matter okay. But the fact is if you look at this you can translate this when you say you extrapolate that is f of x plus delta x equals f of x, this is like applying what is the mathematical boundary condition we are applying, what is the equivalent mathematical boundary condition we are applying that is first order accurate representation dou f dou x equals 0 right, we are basically saying dou f dou x at the boundary is 0, is that fine. You can use three points, you can use three points and set dou f dou x equals 0, right. You can use there is a three point representation for dou f dou x, you can use three points and set dou f dou x equals 0 and you will get a second order extrapolation. Are you making sense? That will use two interior grid points, it will use two interior grid, grid points to determine the third point that is at the boundary, is that clear? Okay, okay. So that is one issue that I wanted to clarify. So remember whether we are talking about solution to Laplace's equation, whether we are talking about solution any equation right, just giving the equation which is what I did here, I started gave you the equation, we did the analysis and I only really provided the boundary conditions when we started to solve the problem right, in fact we even talked about what was the problem but in a sense that is the point, the boundary conditions are what are going to determine what is happening okay, they determine the problem, once you have picked the equation, the equation is known right, what differentiates one flow problem, Euler equation all, all those constraints. 
from the other is the fact that you change the boundary condition okay so the 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 if all else being fixed the application of the boundary condition completely determined should determine completely should determine the solution but then of course there are deal there is issues of upstream downstream and so on but you can try out second order extrapolation fine is that okay right if the exit were a supersonic exit okay if the exit were a supersonic exit all three characteristics will be propagating outward i would just use first order okay i would just use first order these boundary conditions they are called shift boundary conditions shift boundary conditions i would just use first order you understand what i'm saying it's supersonic it's all flowing out nothing is coming back i just use first order i'm not going to put in the effort to do second order is that fine okay right so there has you a little awareness can help you out okay so that's as far as that's as far as uh, boundary conditions go the approximate hand waving boundary conditions now we come to the point where i promised you that we will do it more precisely right and i would prefer to do it using btcs right because we know that btcs that matrix on the left hand side if you replace it by the identity matrix you will get ftcs so we'll do it with btcs general setting and look at how to apply boundary conditions exactly right exactly more more uh, uh, more precisely more exactly okay fine so what was the uh, you remember you remember the delta form delta form basically is i plus do by do x a i always forget this delta t delta t acting on delta q is minus delta t into r okay we can use central differences to discretize this and here and here at this point i want to make a remark because last time i sort of made a remark and let it go i want to make a remark if i use central differences and discretize this a typical term will look like will look like a p minus 1 uh q delta let me see delta t minus 2 delta x i'm sort of doing it in my head so it's going to, right and there's an i and there's a delta t by 2 delta x a p plus 1 q i don't remember last time whether i used superscript or subscript it doesn't matter so this is a typical matrix there are i's along the diagonal there is the minus delta t whatever in the sub diagonal and this matrix acts on delta q1 or delta q0 depending on where you start counting delta q2 delta q p minus 1 delta q p delta q p plus 1 delta q n am i making sense okay and this is delta t times the right hand side so i'll just say right hand side because that's a little more we'll see that the right hand side will become a little more involved because you have to incorporate the boundary conditions and so on right i had sort of casually made a remark but uh, i was hoping that you would point you would you would see this but just in case i wanted to make sure that i pointed it out to you i i uh, if you use gaussian elimination right these are all blocks what i'd mentioned at that time is that you have to do lu decomposition and so on but remember in this particular equation the diagonal elements the pivot elements are all identity matrix so gaussian elimination for this is relatively easy you can actually if you actually try it out you'll see it's relatively easy okay <coughs> as is uh, gauss seidel as is gauss seidel because the identity matrix is on the diagonal however in those list of functions that i suggested that you implement right up front i would suggest that you implement uh, lu decomposition lu decomposition right for a 3 by 3 matrix am i making sense pre implement lu decomposition for a 3 by 3 matrix uh, if you want matrix addition and multiplication matrix multiplication am i making sense okay i would suggest i would suggest that uh, you implement these 
I would suggest that you implement these beforehand because if you do change something here, uh, they are useful functions to have. Okay, so in your base uh, that I was telling you earlier, saying that uh, you know implement how to allocate Q, how to allocate E, A, all of that kinds of stuff. You add a few of these functions, matrix operations functions, right? If you are if you are going to do it for two dimensions, all those matrices would be four by four. If you are doing it for three dimensions, all those matrices will be five by five, and you would have corresponding, right? Corresponding vectors, you, these would become five by five blocks in three dimensions and so on. Is that fine? Is that okay? Right. So now let's look at how we do. We will use this equation. Okay. So I just wanted. This was the second item I wanted to point out. Point out and the need to implement these anyway, despite the fact that you may not find a need for them right now. Okay. Now the second item that I have is uh, well. That's done. What I want to do now is I want to use this equation to apply. Boundary conditions. Okay, so if I look at the left boundary, and I look at a subsonic inlet. So these are the subsonic inlets and subsonic exits are the interesting ones. Inlet. I look at a subsonic inlet. So this is the interface at the inlet. So at this point, at this grid point, I have one. I have this equation I A coming in from the left hand side plus delta t. Now what I am going to do is over this small interval that I have between these few grid points to keep life easy I am going to assume A is a constant. A is not going to be within the operator. Okay, I am going to assume A is a constant. I am going to take the A out do by do x. Why do, you want, why do I want to take the A out? Because I want to multiply by x inverse. Right, if I am going to do it exactly then I have to make sure Q1 hat and Q2 hat are what are being propagated right? or Q3 hat is being extrapolated. Am I making sense? So to that extent I want to take the A out. So this operator acting on delta Q equals minus delta T into R. So remember that I have done this, I have taken that A out. Okay. A is constant but only in, in that neighbourhood, only in that neighbourhood. So then I will multi, pre multiply by X inverse on both sides, I pre multiply by x inverse on both sides, x you remember is the inverse of the matrix of eigenvectors. What does this give me? This will give me an x inverse plus delta t the matrix lambda dou by dou x. acting on x inverse delta q a is constant so x is x inverse is also going to be constant uh, that was a potent assumption right so i could take the x inverse into the derivative you understand what i'm saying this is an operator so by doing this i've taken it into the derivative equals minus x inverse uh, delta t times r I do not remember last time whether retain the delta t or not, it does not matter. Is that fine? X inverse times i is x inverse. Is that fine? Now I see a few quizzical questions. So here I have multiplied x inverse, then inside in, in here I put a x x inverse. You understand what I am saying? So x inverse A x gives me the lambda matrix that leaves an x inverse which I have taken out. That is basically what I have done. Yeah, then there should be i plus. If I am going to factor it out, I should have an i plus. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Fine. Because I factored out x inverse from the right hand side which is a rather neat thing right having multiplied it from the left. Okay. So what does this give me of course this gives me a familiar form lambda dou by dou x acting on delta q hat oops acting on delta q hat is minus x inverse delta t times r and this lambda has you know I have got it in characteristic form. In this lambda has what is this lambda? So depending on how you written the vectors, 
right if you have written depending on how you have written the vectors it will turn out to be that okay of which from this equation from this equation I want only one I want only a third equation I do not want the first two equations the first two equations are coming from outside the boundary I do not want I do not want the third equation I mean I want the third equation I do not want the first two equations. So in order to do that I define a, a uh, what shall I call it a matrix I will define a matrix okay I will call it L I mean it is on the left hand side or you can you can imagine whatever I will define a matrix L which is mostly zeros fine okay and I will pre multiply this by L if I pre multiply this by L and I pre multiply this by L now this has only the third equation am I making sense everyone that is fine. Now we have to go to P0 and T0 is that okay now we have to go to P0 and T0 we have P0 and T0 here coming in we have to go to P0 and T0 and see what we can do. So these boundary conditions right I want to put it in the same delta form okay my objective I will tell you what I am trying to do now what I am trying to do now is take these P0 and T0 right and integrate it into that system of equation. So I have a I have a matrix equation I want my boundary condition to be one of the equations in that system. So then I do not have to worry you know I do not have to deal with it as a I mean of course I am deal with, dealing with it as a separate thing but there is a point at which they all essentially look the same and I have incoming outgoing they are all in the form delta form in the form of a delta delta Q okay. So first we have to make up a vector right because it has to be a block 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 uh, 3 by 3 block everything has to be a 3 by 3 block. So I will make up a vector here I will call it B sub 0 because these are all something sub 0 okay P naught T naught 0. So now I have a state vector like thing for the boundary and I will similarly call this B sub A and create a B sub A which is you can think about whether it matters where I put this and consider at a later time whether it matters where I put this but I will stick it in the third one okay fine. See B could change with time actually you know that you know the reservoir pressure if instead of having a huge reservoir if I have a bottle of air right and I start bleeding air the P0 will drop you know from gas dynamics because expansion is occurring even the T0 will drop temperature in the bottle temperature if you hold the bottle you will find that the temperature actually drop P0 and T0 are a function of right are a function of time normally we assume the reservoir is very large but uh, it is possible that these drop okay bear in mind I still want to look at only for look for only the steady state solution I am only looking for the steady state solution but still I, there is scope open that they are varying in time let me look at what do B dot T is I have not given it a subscript I just say dou B dot T boundary condition using chain rule this is dou B dou Q dou Q dot T right why did I do this now you get because I have a Jacobian I have a dou B dou, dou Q you understand what I am saying so I can actually write this as some D times dou Q dou T is that fine okay and if this happens to be 0 there are lots of ways by which we can do it I just decided to use it if this happens to be 0 dou B dou T happens to be 0 so otherwise you would discretize this am I making sense you discretize this using forward time or backward time or whatever it is but dou B dou T we are looking for the steady state we assume P0 and T0 are constant if that is 0 then in delta form this will come become d delta q equals 0 is that fine everyone is that fine. So on the left hand side the equation that I have in the left hand side where I have this subscript 0 
I would have D naught put a semicolon there delta Q equals 0 and on the right hand side I will have D A delta Q equals 0. Is that fine? Now my boundary conditions are in delta form, very similar to the rest of the equations, fine. What do I need to do? Tell me. On the one hand I have, on the one hand I have L times I plus delta T lambda dou by dou x is minus L times x inverse delta T into R. I wish I had absorbed the delta T in that R but anyway it does not matter. And then the other hand we have left hand side, this is at the left hand side remember we did this for the left hand side, D naught delta Q equals 0 but this D naught delta Q what was the mistake we were making earlier when we were prescribing P naught and T naught? We do not know whether we were propagating, we were prescribing only Q1 hat and Q2 hat. We were most probably prescribing conditions in Q1 hat, Q2 hat and Q3 hat. Am I making sense? Okay. So this is, see this is this is equivalent. I will give you an equivalent example. If this is like if you if you think back to your engineering mechanics, you have a simply supported beam, right? I, I, there are boundary conditions. In fact, if this if this were on rollers, you definitely know that there are boundary conditions here that is basically only normal. This this doesn't generate a boundary condition that is tangential. Am I making sense? Right. So you if you prescribe a tangential boundary condition, there is an issue then. All that if you if you and if you prescribe a force this way, of course, it will be taken by the pin joint, right? But the boundary condition itself cannot have a tangential component. Am I making sense? So if you are solving this problem, if somebody you know, then you throw away the tangential component. It is not. It's not. It is not there. It doesn't exist. It's not relevant to the problem. Just because right? You say, oh, consider why don't you consider a vector like this? They say, no, that doesn't work. I'm going to only take the vertical component. In a similar fashion, this has all three P naught and T naught have Q1 hat, Q2 hat, Q3 hat. But we will take only the Q1 hat and Q2 hat component, we will throw away the Q3 hat. You understand? It is basically analogous. So, how do I get that? How do I get the first two? I have L which picks the last one. So, I minus L will pick the, the first two, okay. So, I can make I minus L times that. Whoop, I have a mistake. What is the mistake? First I have to get it into characteristic form. So I pre multiply by x inverse, I have to project it onto the right coordinate system. That is in this case if I have a coordinate system that is like this which is most probably why you have got. So I have to first project it onto the right coordinate system. I need to get a coordinate system that is aligned along the direction in which right my forces are acting. Am I making sense? Right. So I have some oddball coordinate system. I need to project it on the right coordinate system which is what I am doing here. Okay. So you do this, this equation then becomes D naught hat delta Q hat equals 0, please, pardon me, delta Q hat, oh I am really making a lot of mistakes, okay, thank you, okay and I pre multiply this by I minus L, okay and for the very first grid point, for the very first grid point I combine this equation and that equation and again now I have three equations, everything, everything works, am I making sense? I combine this with that, everybody fine with that, I combine this with that, fine into one equation, I can just add them up. I can just add them up. So what will I get if I add them up? I will get uh, if you, I do not know whether to factor out the I minus L or not or I can just add them up. I can say this, let me just add plus L times I plus delta T 
lambda dou by dou x delta q hat equals minus L x inverse delta t into r. So the right hand side I have only added 0 from the boundary conditions, I have not added anything right because this right hand side is 0, I have not touched my right hand side. So the right hand side will only have that only have that third equation, the form from the third equation. What now? You have two possibilities. Sometimes I just solve it in the characteristic form. Sometimes I just I be very honest with you, I just solve it in the characteristic form. I mean I talk about integrating it. In CFD we very rarely assemble, right? Uh, uh, CFD we very rarely assemble that uh, that matrix, that big matrix that I was talking about. We are very rarely, if you talk to your friends who are doing finite element method and structures and so on, they will talk about assembling the global stiffness matrix. They actually assemble the matrix, they put it together, right? We very rarely assemble the matrix. We try to avoid assembling the matrix. We may compute the Jacobians as required, right? Depending on the circumstances, we may compute the Jacobians as required. Or if you feel, I mean, if it turns out that it works, you may assemble, not assemble, but you may store all the Jacobians. But typically we will compute the Jacobians as we very rarely actually assemble that big matrix and if you do you will only store the diagonals and so on. So you keep track of what is happening, is that fine, okay. Now in this case if you wanted to, if you, but if you wanted in your mind to have it in terms of Q which you may do, then you would pre multiply this whole thing again by how do I take it back to the original coordinate system. So you rotated it one way, now you have to rotate it back, okay. You pre multiply the whole thing by an X. And you can actually, you can actually analytically work out this equation. You can actually analytically work out this equation, right? Okay. Maybe at the end of the semester, if we have time, I'll give it to you. But you should be able to do it. By now, you should be able to do it, right? I'll leave it as a exercise. First of all, try to make sure you're able to find d naught and so on. Fine. Is it clear? Is it obvious that uh, it would be something similar on the right-hand side for p ambient? What would happen for P ambient? Can you guess? Can we just look at this and write out what happens for P ambient? So instead of instead of we have only one condition coming, so if on the right hand side it would be an L times D A hat delta Q hat. And just doing I am just looking at the chalk dust and doing a pattern match. You should just check to make sure that there are no issues. Okay plus i minus l times the equation because there are two of them propagating to the left see it from the left to the right you just have to look at the interface what is coming from the left has an i minus l on it what is coming from the right right has a l on it is that fine okay i plus delta t lambda dou by dou x delta q hat Yes, I minus L delta T times R, close the big bracket. Is that fine? Okay. X inverse. Yes. Yeah, this is what happens. I am very proud of the fact that I remembered the I minus L. I forgot the X inverse. Okay, that is fine. Right. You have to be careful. Algebraic manipulation calculus, you have to be a bit careful. It is very easy to get excited about something that you have done and make a mistake elsewhere. Fine. Okay. We are back. What now? So remember this equation. This is the equation. This is the equation that you will use. So I will erase the top one now and I will write. This is the equation that you will use at any arbitrary interior point. right right at time level q so this is at point p this is also at point p at some interior point this is the equation that you will use at the inlet and only at the grid point only at the inlet grid point only at the inlet grid point am i making sense only at the inlet grid point that is this is the inlet 
at this grid point. This is the this is the outside. This is where P naught T naught is coming from. This is the first interior grid point. This is applied only at that point. Okay, and this equation is applied only at the exit point. Fine. Okay, so only at the exit point. So we have P ambient here at this grid point, and you use the interior grid point. So obviously, when you discretize the derivative using the interior grid point, you're going to use backward differences here and you are going to use forward differences here. So the propagation will be in the right direction. Is that fine? Okay, so this sort of feels a little better than that oh let us extrapolate you all of that kind of but it is obviously a lot of work, right. It, it feels intellectually a lot better but it is a lot of work, right. It is a lot of work. In one dimensions it seems relatively easy. These ideas Right. See, I am doing one D one dimensional flow. The stability analysis that we have done. Okay, I just want to make a, I want to make an observation here. The stability analysis that we have done in this course extend to three dimensions and two dimensions in the sense that you can sort of squint at that equation and say that yeah, this is the stability analysis. Am I making sense? You can come up with the because we know now what do we what do we know? Typically, it's going to be like the CF, we need to know what is the CFL, right? And that will be like propagation speed, some propagation speed. So you have to figure out what is the propagation speed times delta t divided by delta x. Well, it is not delta x, there are three dimensions. Figure out some way to come up with the length scale, right. Propagation speed delta t divided by length scale. That extends to multiple dimensions. I am rationalizing why I am restricting myself to 1D here. I am justifying it. These boundary conditions, well, when you come to the boundary, when you actually come to a 3D manifold come to the boundary well basically at that boundary you either have characteristics that are propagating information out of the domain or into the domain. So there you can sort of locally do a 1D you understand what I am saying 1D local coordinates 1D and you can actually do something like this okay or you can cheat the way <laughs> I have told you earlier and extrapolate the appropriate U or extrapolate the appropriate T naught it depends. It is not that easy but right multiple dimensions here there are other issues that are involved. Is that fine? This is okay. Okay. So now you have seen sort of the full spectrum right the full spectrum of possible ways by which you can apply boundary conditions okay. And of course on top of all of this stuff you can now decide how you are going to solve this fine. So instead of solving this equation using Gaussian elimination that is solving a system of equation you can actually use say LU approximate factorization right which I do not think I have done for the block matrices. So you can actually do LU approximate factorization there is a reason why I want to write this out. So you, act, you can actually do LU approximate factorization right. So the if you remember LU approximate factorization we wrote it as dou by dou x minus two operators split it as two operators acting on delta q is minus delta t into r and this can be factored this can be factored as i this can be factored approximately as delta t a dou by dou x acting on delta q equals minus delta t into r okay. So this derivative would involve the grid points p and p minus 1. This derivative would involve the grid points p plus 1 and p okay. So you get a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix and you can just again just do forward substitution back, sub, back substitution it is much faster than doing solving a system of equations okay and the error is of the order of delta t square the error is of the order of delta t square it is a product of what is the error term that we get the error we are making is delta t square dou by dou x minus a acting on dou by dou x plus a remember these are operators acting on delta q that is the that is the error that we are making on the left hand side but if you are looking for the steady state this is going to go to 0 anyway delta q is going to go to 0 anyway how do you care. Is that fine? Okay, everyone. Right. Now here, 
when you are doing this extra play, so you have to be a bit you can you can now decide at what which sweep you are going to do when you are doing the extrapolation so in one case in this case this involves what grid points p and p minus 1 right so this will involve coming up coming up right it will involve this point and this point but if you were to actually try to if you were to try to actually work figure out what the value at that point is you do not have a p minus 1 you understand there is no p minus 1 this involves a p and p plus 1 so this boundary condition here you are likely to apply it in the u sweep because it involves p and p plus 1 to determine the value at p this is you should this is important <laughs> you understand what I am saying this is important right because otherwise LU decompose LU approximate factorization that is the thing that people always come back saying how do where do I apply boundary condition you come to the other end so that will be applied in the L sweep right because you are going to determine the value at P using the P minus 1 quantity am I making sense because you are using one sided derivatives for the boundary condition that is the critical part using one sided derivatives for the boundary condition fine are there any questions so this is a this is a relatively uh, straightforward way to do it of course as I said when you get here when you get there during the sweep you will obviously be using the equations that correspond to the boundary condition and not corresponding to the equation itself okay so uh, we have now a method and of course because we are saying that the r going to 0 tells us determines when you have a solution r is something like a it is a predicate you, uh, you ask the question do I have the solution you understand it is a discriminant it tells us what is happening okay. So you want to calculate you want to treat r carefully right r determines just like the boundary conditions determine the solution in that sense r determines when you are at the solution okay this determines a correction on the left hand side the left hand side determines a correction right so the right hand side the right hand side so in a sense you can look at this and say I can make the right hand side as, as accurate as I want because that determines the accuracy of the steady state when the when the r goes to 0 if you are able to say r goes to 0 second order accurate then you have a second order accurate solution right third order accurate you have a third order accurate solution the representation is of that order on the left hand side you want acceleration you want it to go fast right so you can fund you can do lots of lots of stuff in order to get there quickly okay however I hope you have seen this in your controls you have to be a bit careful right I am now talking about uh, observations and corrections think in controls lingo now you have, to, you have to be a bit careful so if you have fine changes fine changes that you detect which triggers your controller to make a correction but the correction is always very large then you will be hunting for the solution if the delta q's if this is really coarse the difference between the order of this and that is so bad that small changes here create reasonably sizable delta q so this has to be well behaved you have to be very careful with the choice of this right so as long as it's well behaved it doesn't matter you can make you can make r right as accurate as you want but you have to make sure that a small perturbation here doesn't create a large delta q there and you can end up then hunting for the solution do you understand what i mean you are the r basically triggers an idea oh it has to be delta q is a large is a positive quantity you get a large largish delta q which causes the correction to be too large which causes r to say that your feedback is slightly negative then you get a largish delta because your delta q size your is coarseness is so coarse that your correction is slightly coarse and then students will come back saying that oh it converges to 10 power minus 10 and then it seems you are oscillating at 10 power minus 10 or it converges to 10 power minus 6 and it seems you are oscillating at 10 power minus 10. the corrections that you are generating are too large okay and you are not able to pin down the solution you you, you do not have that kind of resolution so it starts to hunt am I making sense is that okay right so uh, sometimes you have to be careful you do not get carried away with but typically this is well behaved see I am being very vague now because I was equally vague when I said oh you can make it anything you want 
as long so as long as it's well behaved right because now i'm just waving my hands i'm just saying r goes to zero as long as this is not singular delta q will go to zero okay so r goes to zero delta q will go to zero it does not matter with what we multiply delta q right and as long as it's well behaved you'll get there i leave it that i will leave it in that vague sense fine and something like this lu approximate factorization works one last thing if you wanted to add if you wanted to add for whatever reasons you are getting oscillations and you 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 are tempted to add artificial dissipation right right this is this is supposed to work this is supposed to be unconditionally stable you are tempted to add there are some oscillations that are not dying out you are in a hurry and you say i'll just add artificial dissipation you can add it implicitly to the left hand side if you add it implicitly to the left hand side it does it still the second derivative still gives you only a tridiagonal matrix the second derivative still gives you only a tridiagonal matrix am i making sense the second derivative still gives you only a tridiagonal matrix fine so you could don't have to add it explicitly you can add it implicitly if you add want to add fourth order fourth derivative term then that will change the bandwidth that will change this right it won't be tridiagonal anymore i would suggest that you can add, add that explicitly so it will contaminate your solution right but if you add the artificial dissipation on the left hand side especially the second derivative it's not going to contaminate your solution because it multiplies the delta q that's going to zero is that fine so it gives you the, it gives you a term you should give you know you should get a tremendous sense of uh, freedom feeling of freedom because there are lots of things that you can fiddle around with knowing that the delta q if as long as you don't mess up the fact that you're going to the solution that the delta q is going to zero so the amount of exploration that you can do is quite large okay okay this is done now what is closing remarks i want to say uh, this will lead basically into our next class what we are going to do is you have a pipe that's of length l you had a pipe of length l and we applied boundary conditions on the left hand side we applied boundary conditions on the left hand side using characteristics right and we use applied boundary conditions on the right hand side using characters instead of the pipe being of length l what if the pipe was of length delta x you imagine that you have a pipe that's only of length delta x so you have two boundaries you have something going on inside you want to find out what's going on inside and it looks like we have a mechanism now you understand we have a mechanism now to determine what's happening in that little volume of of size delta x just by applying compatible boundary conditions the right boundary conditions after all the boundary conditions came from the equations okay so at some interior delta x i would basically say oh there are characteristics coming from the left hand side at the interface right there are characteristics coming from the left hand side to this interface because it happens to be subsonic there are characteristics coming from the that are propagating in that direction this is delta x and you have two going this way and one going that way right so from within this little volume delta x the flux term here is determined by these two characteristics coming from within this volume and one characteristic coming from outside the volume from the neighboring volume see right we now you see scope for a scheme is actually possible that we are talking about boundary conditions but it's actually possible that we can cook up a scheme using this because remember when we talked about finite volume method earlier what was it that i said you have the state at this point and you don't have the flux you don't have the state where you have the flux now we are saying aha wait a minute i have the state in the interior i have the state in the interior and i have some way by which i can figure out what is propagating to the boundary right so it must be possible for us to come up with a scheme based on based on all of this and see then you would be doing method of characteristics right and the fact that we can do this kind of manipulation yeah you can go into the characteristic coordinates you can come out of the characteristic coordinates right we have an easy way of getting into the characteristic coordinates and getting out of the characteristic coordinates and after all we are only talking about an interface so even in multiple dimensions i will just do we are not going to look at multiple dimensions in this course even in multiple dimensions you have the state in the interior this is a volume i pick a triangle because uh, it is not a quadrilateral you don't think you are not thinking cartesian coordinates right and you have the same thing so you can figure out what is the what's coming in what's going out right what's coming in 
what is going on I do not know. Am I making sense? Right, I cleverly put two going out there because otherwise Q1 hat and Q2 hat will be accumulating inside. There is a problem, everything is coming in. Fine, is that okay? Right, but we are not going to be looking at this. This is just now I am dreaming. This is based on what we have done for boundary conditions and the little realization that oh, I can take a delta x and apply boundary conditions there. I am sort of in my mind jumping saying, wow, I can do stuff like this, need stuff like this. Okay, is that fine? So, in the next class. We will see whether we can use these ideas of applying boundary conditions to actually come up with a class of schemes, fine, okay.